Welcome to this conversation on some of the major questions, major controversies really facing our world. My name is John O'Sullivan, I'm the president of the Danube Institute, and today um, we've brought together three seasoned observers and commentators on European and international and American trends to discuss in particular two large questions, though we will probably uh, wander onto others too. The first of those questions is what has been the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on politics, economic, uh, economics, and perhaps even the texture uh, of modern life and consciousness? Are we moving into a different kind of world in ways most of us haven't foreseen uh, than the world we've known really since modernity emerged? The second question is a more down-to-earth and familiar one. Um, how do all three of you view the situation in the United States following the defeat of Donald Trump and the election of Joe Biden as president? Um, so much for the questions. Now, let me turn uh, for the audience's sake uh, to those who are answering them. Um, our three guests are, first of all, Boris Kalnok, um, foreign policy journalist, primarily concerned with European political trends um, and with the European Union trends. He, is an in, he has particular interest uh, in um, all of the questions facing the EU um, as, and in also um, uh, questions like um, the strategies for dealing with coronavirus um, by various different European countries. Second guest is David Engels, a historian, an academic, and a conservative thinker. He deals with the modern political aspects of classical Christian Europe in his writing. He has addressed the impact of coronavirus uh, on the education system and schools. Um, and the third speaker is Max Otter, an economist, former academic, entrepreneur, political activist, a member of the Christian Democratic Union in Germany. He's previously set out links between the German and European policy decisions and the economic situation, and those links are, of course, key at the moment. Um, and a few weeks ago, he published a book um, in which he wrote about the, in, in which, as Max Otter also writes, about the economic impact of the coronavirus. Um, he lived in the United States in the 1990s, and um, he was there, an observer um, in the 2020 presidential election. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Um, uh, Boris, I want to begin, if I may, with you. Uh, how do you see the coronavirus policy of the European Union and its member state uh, in international comparisons, both with each other and with how other countries, Europe, uh, particularly the United States, and particularly Britain in Europe? Um, and what do you think the long-term impact of the coronavirus will be on the state of the EU and uh, on European policy? It's obviously having a big impact on Germany, isn't it? We see recent um, opinion polls suggesting that there's been a strengthening of what until now has been very modest Euro skepticism. Uh, and indeed the AFD is thinking of embracing uh, that policy, presumably called Dexit, um, since it would separate it would be the only party actually uh, embracing that approach. Uh, it may not be an election winner, but it may be a a, a, a policy that would strengthen their representation. Yeah, well, thank you, John. And let's begin with the uh, with the EU. Um, EU leaders um, jumped on the occasion to turn this into a major moment for European solidarity, show that uh, no problem of any dimension can really be solved on the national level. Only the EU can make things work. That turned out to be a uh, major catastrophe as, um, as uh, Eurocrats were late in authorizing uh, vaccines that, that were uh, uh, authorized much more quickly in Britain, the United States, uh, Israel, in short, countries that were not EU members. And uh, quickly a, uh, a mood emerged where different countries, especially in Germany, uh, people were asking, how, how can it be that uh, all these countries who are not in the EU are doing it better than, than we are, especially in the case of Germany used to be, um, was well, seeing itself as a world champion in just about everything. Um, a, a sense of frustration emerged that 
that they, they, they are doing a bad job of this vaccination campaign and maybe it's because they delegated it to, to Brussels. So here is one major, um, one major consequence for uh, Germany. They have now passed a law um, essentially, uh, essentially um, blocking the prerogatives of um, the federal states in order to enable a uh, homogeneous um, policy on the national level. So there is that. Uh, obviously, as we all know, the EU has, has adopted uh, their next generation plan of, of showering everyone with lots of money. Uh, in order to do this, um, uh, the EU as such uh, will take uh, will take uh, will indebt itself. This debt will be guaranteed by member states. This is a first for European politics, and it's um, um, it's a first step towards federalization. Um, what will that lead to? Well, I suppose it will lead to friction and frustration once um, countries like Hungary or Poland will be blocked from getting funds because allegedly they uh, do not observe the rule of law. Um, and then later, I imagine countries like Italy will come and say, sorry, we cannot repay the loans. And then the Germans will, will, will ask, well, why not? And so all, all kinds of problems down the road. Hasn't it had a bad impact too on the relations between France and Germany? Because in some ways at the beginning of the um, pandemic or rather the beginning of the attempts to solve it with vaccination policies, the French and the Germans seem more or less allied together. And yet, since the, uh, well, since the failure of the French vaccine to be developed in time, so to speak, and since uh, whereas we've seen more successful uh, policies pursued in both uh, the United States and Germany uh, and Britain, and indeed, uh, the pattern is very interesting. The countries which did well in the first stage of the pandemic seem to be handling it well, have handled the vaccine uh, vaccination um, policy much less successfully uh, and the and vice versa so all of a sudden uh, one has the sense that there is no um, that every country has begun to act however slowly and however covertly in its own interests within the EU in a way that probably must have long-term consequences for how they react to any other major collective problem. Well, I would argue that uh, EU member states have always looked out for themselves and have always uh, represented their own interests, just, just hiding it under the, the mantle of, of European solidarity and all that. And then obviously we have, we have the, um, the French, uh, the concept of French-German um, uh, friendship in order to overcome uh, the, um, uh, the spirit that led to two world wars. However, French policy has always been to, to, um, to bind Germany in, uh, in a way that would uh, keep the Germans from becoming too, shall I say, too uh, um, independent in their, in their foreign policy, uh, while at the same time trying to get as much uh, money from, from prosperous Germany as, as possible and if possible in an institutionalized way, a permanent way. Um, Germany uh, has not made strategic decisions, uh, but it, it does have the option to, to look towards the East, where we have the Visegrad bloc. Um, they share the same um, economic philosophies as, as historically the Germans. They like, um, they like to not spend too much money. You should not spend more than you earn and all that. Um, and I, I sense uh, a hesitation in, in Germany on, on how to go forward. Shall we, shall we try um, and use these Eastern European, Eastern Central European countries as a counterweight to France? Um, and um, a lot of strife between France and uh, Central Europeans is maybe down to that. Uh, the latest news, I think, is that the uh, the um, Germany has just uh, been trying to get a, the, the vaccine from Russia um, and um, ordering it. Um, one of the commentators on this, I think Wolfgang Munchau said, 
this was a demonstration of the fact that the um, German-Russian relationship was now the single most strategically important relationship in Europe. Would you like to comment on both those things? Well, here's an interesting thought, John. If, if we go back in time, even to the 1920s, there was an Institute for Geopolitik in, in, in Munich, um, which propagated the idea of a Eurasian Union. And obviously, this is something which led to bad consequences as the Nazis embraced that spirit uh, and perverted it, I must say. Um, but uh, there, there is a, a bas basic strategic thought in continental European political thinking that the, uh, the maritime uh, dominance of the United States and Britain, uh, their dominance of a, of a sea trade um, might be counterbalanced by, by developing, uh, developing very close relationships with uh, Russia and even China uh, over land. So here's a, a, strate a strategic thought that I think still lingers in Germany if we look at the the uh, Nord Stream 2 project, which is um, in um, uh, not at all what the Americans think might be in their interest. So here we have a, an objective um, area of, uh, of conflict of interest, I think, between the United States and, and Germany and indeed continental Europe. Perhaps I could now turn uh, to David Engels. Um, a few weeks ago, you were saying in the Polish newspaper article, um, that the coronavirus has had a very severe effect on the education system. Now, I think everyone would agree with that in a common sense way, because the, um, uh, we can see that education has been denied to, for a year and maybe now longer to, um, uh, to students. And um, they, frankly, most people don't seem to think that the teaching through the uh, internet is, is as effective. Maybe you differ on that. But what do you um, what do you mean apart from that common sense point about the impact of coronavirus on the on the system, the education system? Yeah, well, I I'm regularly observing this uh, on the one hand as a, as a family father, as I have two children here at home who are also in distance learning, and, and as a university professor. Uh, where I'm confronted weekly to teaching basically to a black screen for hours and hours. And so uh, in conclusion from my own uh, observations, I'm, I'm, I'm far from convinced that this format is really um, successful. Of course, everyone is trying hard. Yeah, I see that the teachers and my colleagues, they're all really trying to, to do their best and to, to use these tools as good as they can. But unfortunately, uh, as we know, real education is based on things like human interaction, like some form of, of personal mm -hmm. improvement, like teacher-student interaction. And this is really missing from this system. It can't really be incorporated uh, as spontaneously into a computer program than to, to a common presence in the, in the seminar room. And if you add to that the, the really severe uh, effects also that this lockdown is, is exercising on the psyche of young people who are really locked down, uh, closed in in their homes partly for one year with nothing else to do than to, to keep to their own four walls, this is really uh, the, the uh, best uh, situation to, to, to have a lost generation as a bit the, the, the generation of the first world war. But I think it's even worse than that, because um, I, in, in my view, this, this coronavirus uh, impact or the lockdown impact on the education system is only acting as some form of catalyst to many thought experiments that were already um, in place before. From my own experience, uh, when I taught at the, at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, I, I, I can assert that already at that moment, many people essentially from the administration were thinking about, is it really necessary to have all these full-time high, not really high paid, but still from their point of view, uh, professors uh, uh, working for us uh, only to give uh, a, a half a dozen hour of, uh, of courses uh, uh, per, per week. And many at that moment were already saying, well, we could just simply uh, make some form of, 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 of video clips of what they have to say, and then basically we play that every year. So we could uh, cut costs or just transform these seminars into some form of 
interactive uh, digital tools. That was already discussed before the COVID crisis. And I really strongly fear that now <laughs> with the, the, this experiment uh, uh, taking for, for one year, that many people will say, okay, well, now we tried it. All the, uh, all the psychological barriers are, are broken. Uh, we have the tools, so let's impose that on a, a large scale. And that would be, of course, uh, disastrous uh, when it comes also to the political manipulation of such a system, which would then be, of course, absolutely at the mercy of, of any form of, of, of political interference. I mean, already now, schools, universities, media are very strongly dominated by, by, by leftist liberal uh, points of view. Already in schools, in kindergarten, you are confronted with LGBTQ stuff, with gender theory, with racism, post-colonialism, and so forth. Uh, so um, that is, of course, uh, extremely dangerous as such. Uh, computer or digitally based system would be very open to that kind of manipulation and even enhance even more these, uh, these, these disastrous tendencies. And the results of these tendencies, they can be seen, of course, everywhere. When we see how in, in Bologna studies and in comparison with uh, China, for example, or East Asian nation, where we see the, the, the rapid decline of, of the Western world when it comes to, 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 to general education, to some form of frustration, tolerance, to competences and so forth. So I, I think that this COVID crisis and the lockdown and the distance learning will accelerate this evolution and lead potentially to, to a long-term disaster. And obviously, we can see in China, that, that which, which has, of course, other methods of social control at its disposal, um, that this is uh, uh, the internet and, and this, this kind of technical um, future can have seriously worrying um, uh, tendencies towards oppression. Um, but what about in the West? because I'm thinking of the impact on the student's personality. That does, do they rebel against this? I mean, there is some evidence in the United States that a lot of the students desperately keen to get out of lockdown, desperately keen to have some kind of fiesta in one sense, but, but do, they, do they also want to get away from this somewhat impersonal uh, medium of learning into one in which, as you say, you have an exchange of ideas. And um, and, and and final point, um, students may not always tell the truth. Um, I mean, then a lot of the time in universities now, they feel they're um, being in, in, indoctrinated rather than participating in, in education. And um, in those circumstances, I mean, um, do we think this is going to be, I mean, is this a more effective means of control uh, or a less effective means of control? Maybe you can ignore a computer screen more easily or turn, turn the sound down um, than you can um, ignore a, a flesh and blood human being in front of you. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the, these are these are very good questions. So the, I, I could respond to the first two, that is to the difference between the Chinese quality of education and to the fact whether or not uh, students in, in the Western world really would like to get out of this distance learning system. That what makes us different, unfortunately, by now from the Chinese system is that Anyway, we have lost, very unfortunately, this, this, this old Humboldtian idea of education as being some form of self-development, that's sure. But in comparison to the Chinese, they apply a highly technicized means for education, but at least they do this in a certain, uh, uh, in a certain framework where they value ambition, uh, hard work, uh, output, and so forth. Whereas our education system is unfortunately since the 68s at latest, at, 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 la at least, uh, based on some form of anti-authoritarian policy where the most important is to, to keep students and pupils away from any form of frustration and where bad results are generally attributed to the system or to the teacher or the professor and never, of course, to the students themselves. So even universities are paid not on the quality of what they achieve, but to the, the, the more output of student they produce. So they have every incentive in let, letting pass as much people as possible and to just uh, uh, instrumentalize 
the the grading system in order to to have very positive uh, or allegedly positive outcomes so that makes us different from the chinese and that explains also why i feel that many of my students if i'm really honest uh, are not really keen in having a, a teacher or a professor that wants to impose some form of quality or or to discuss with them or to have their opinion because they are not interested in giving their opinion their their, their main interest after they go through that school system and that media barrage is simply to 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 learn some things by heart to have their know to have their grade to be out of all that and not to have to interact too much or to think too much and so i guess sometimes that many of them are quite happy with the, with that system because they can simply uh, put their their, their their screen on blank they turn the sound off and then they do some computer gaming during the time i'm i'm trying to teach something so i think many of them are, are unfortunately quite happy with this with that really perverse system so i i don't even think that they see this as a possibility to to escape any form of political form of indoctrination as they live all or as most of them live already beyond political thinking they are already beyond any form of interference with right or left wing or whatever politics they have become opportunists who have been drilled or who have been taught to just reproduce what the media what the school says to them they do not necessarily believe in that they just want to have their peace and to have their to have their grades so they're even beyond that kind of consideration uh, which is which is really sad because they're even a, a step further than what we what we fear and that is also why it is so difficult to to wake them up and to to bring them back to some form of, of yes. critical thinking because that is so disagreeable of course because it yes. it imposes some form of effort well i think the paradox of education is contained in that um, joke by um, Mark Twain, that a classic is a book that everyone wants to have read, but no one wants to read. Of course, once you have read it, you're glad you've read it. But there is an element of initial com compulsion in, in, in good education, which uh, we're trying to avoid now, I think, in, I think foolishly and um, futilely. But perhaps I can move on to Max Otto on keeping on the same topic, because you've written in your book, um, Wealth System Crash, um, uh, this was before the coronavirus, um, that partly because of the strengthening of digital culture, maybe we were overthrowing and coming to the end of the Enlightenment. Perhaps you would like to develop that argument a little. Actually, I've borrowed in from Henry Kissinger, who wrote a brilliant article in the Atlantic Monthly about two or three years ago. Uh, and uh, it's really well done. And um, what he said is that was the algorithms um, they are learning, they, they are everywhere, and they may take good decisions, but we don't know how to think about those decisions because we don't know how those algorithms think. Mm -hmm. So our philosophy, our whole system is, is past that. So that's the philosophical level. The more practical level that David uh, talked about is that indeed we, we come to a leveling down um, the young generation often doesn't want to hear this um, and, and they just want to get on. And um, it's not like you have to turn, you turn your screen off uh, when you, you're dependent on those venues then of, of transmission. So they can be manipulated. Simple thing is when Donald Trump did a tweet, there was a warning sign, a disclaimer put uh, b below every tweet. Yeah, we've seen the third wave of massive uh, channel um, um, erasions, uh, er erasures on, on YouTube. We have, some of my friends have been erased on YouTube and those are completely uh, serious and respectable channels, but they happen to disagree with official opinion. So um, technological totalitarianism is very close. And about six years ago, I wrote a book. Um, I was a co-author with Martin Schulz and, and Matthias Döpfner from Springer and, and Sigmar Gabriel and, and Shoshana Zuber from Harvard. So it was a, a, a Zurkamp book, Technological Totalitarianism. And uh, actually the left, the SPD has, has pushed this and uh, did push it in Germany and the Democrats pushed it in the US for a while until they realized, well, the big tech is our biggest backer. So, and there was an accident. There was an accident going on with... Um, 
with um, Donald Trump and um, with, uh, let's say, social media in general, because it gave the people a voice. So if you say that media is maybe 90% left controlled, in Germany, maybe 98% or 95%, whatever, uh, in, in Hungary and in, in Poland, it's a bit better. But uh, still, I mean, we have in, in the most Western countries, we have this immense Western dominance, and there's a coalition between um, the technology oligarchs in the left. And um, so now you can cut off people from the net, you can manipulate, you can um, certainly dampen certain messages, you can amplify other messages. This goes way to the way those uh, social media giants run their things. I cannot promote for, for money my new book, The Crisis, Die Krise hält sich nicht an Regeln, The Crisis is Not Bound to Rules, because it refers to a current event. Uh, which is Corona. And so Twitter is free to, to ban, uh, to, to not take my advertisement. I cannot advertise anything political, but I constantly see on Twitter sponsored ads for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So it's really the rules have been twisted by big tech in a manner, in a way that is um, really, really disheartening because, uh, I mean, um, they are so we have three levels. We have the philosophical level that we don't know what the algorithms do, and that we uh, we are past the development. Then we have the uh, indeed the um, let's say leveling down of the the, the dialogue of, of the of the level of dialogue and, and education, and then we have the active control by the tech companies on how to structure actually. Um, dialogue or how to get their message across so it's a, it's a it's a very rapid drift into technological totalitarianism i agree very strongly with those three points but let me raise the, not an optimistic point but an optimistic question um if we were luddites in the 19th century uh, we would have said somewhat similar things about the spinning jenny and other machines. Um, what we've just seen, as you've described it, is the loss of gatekeeper control in the first phase of the internet, um, which was very creative and demonstrated very often that we were being lied to, sometimes in the most specific, narrow way about a particular event, but more broadly, uh, the, the, the exclusion of views was suddenly uh, overtaken by the openness of the system. And now um, the, the people who, uh, or the social classes, broadly speaking, which controlled them uh, with the gatekeepers before, they've suddenly found new ways of controlling, restoring their own influence again. Yeah. Um, is that not an unstable situation, however? Are we not likely to see uh, a, a, the, a reaction to that? which when including a moral reaction, which you, of course, have just given voice to, um, which will restore some kind of genuine argument and debate. Um, there is, of course, uh, let's say, retreats and enclaves like uh, Think Spot by Jordan Peterson or whatever. So we, we have some free spots. Mm -hmm. But uh, to quote Davidson, my favorite philosopher, um, Man only is appalled by threats uh, and is very quickly uh, gets used to the, the facts. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't see so much. I mean, I see how uh, resistance is, is really pulled, uh, put down in Germany. I mean, um, open debate. Um, we had, uh, let's say, pretty open popular movements against the mass imported mass migration with this Pegida and so on. This was the media, of course. Uh, put it in a bad light from the beginning of it, but people went to the streets. We had it now again with, with the corona measures, with the anti-democratic corona measures. But um, right now, the grip of the regime or of the powers that be is strengthening. I cannot say otherwise. We saw it with the end of Donald Trump's reign or presidency, or however you may call it, that um, of course, we don't know everything about how it ended, but to switch off a sitting president with 75 million followers just from that media is, uh, is uh, amazing and, and is going contrary to pretty much everything I, I believe in. And uh, so right now, now I think the counter-revolution, the uh, restoration is in full swing still. Well, I, I can't disagree with that. But let me ask you one other question before I come on to the question, question of Trump. And that is that one of the events, uh, one of the causes 
of change um, is, of course, an economic collapse. In other words, if you're running a system which suddenly runs into the buffers and people, millions are out of work and the system seizes up, um, that tends to discredit the, the people in charge and to energize critics against it. Um, well, you have been rather pessimistic. In fact, you've been accurate in predicting um, some of the uh, uh, problems coming. Do you see an economic crash coming um, anytime soon, like which would have some of the effects that the 1931, uh, 29 and 31 crash had? Not anything like this. And uh, I see the crack up boom that Ludwig von Mises talked about much more likely that people rush into real assets like stocks, uh, real estate, uh, precious metals and so on and so forth, because money will be worth nothing. So actually, I we are pretty much fully invested in our mutual funds and we we uh, perform from well, but we I, I'm long, I'm long on in the financial markets. Um, and Unfortunately, what's happening now makes perfect sense if you look at it from the perspective that our system is, uh, let's say, at its end, uh, that um, debt is not um, uh, sustainable, that um, we get uh, cracks in the system, that all the things are happening. But, but, um, so we have this buildup of debt, we have the buildup of the monetary supply, we have to wipe the slate clean. We have to basically come to a negotiated solution if we not let it crash, um, which nobody wants. So the uh, alternative is a forced negotiated solution, which you do with a planned economy was forced. And that's exactly that's what's happening. Um, plus, we do a forced switch from, um, from the real world to the digital world. Uh, corona, I'm not talking about the medical aspects of it, but it's the ideal, uh, let's say, argument to make that switch and um, our economy even with some problems is productive enough to pretty much in the west and so on give everybody also in, in the middle income countries give everybody a, a decent living what is happening is that since we are switching to dig digital technologies um, jeff bezos wealth grew by 55 billion last year uh, so you can see who profits. But it's, as we are switching to the uh, digital economy, uh, a very few people, the oligarchs will get much richer, are getting much richer already. Uh, the middle class will get hammered and will go pretty much diminish, dwindle, and that's a pillar of democracy. And we'll have a huge um, number of people who will be dependent on social security or in unconditional income and so on, but that will be provided. Um, the system is productive enough to provide many people with some kind of subsistence. They will vote for the forces that are in power, um, shopkeepers, um, the, um, let's say, inns, all kinds of independent smaller operators will fail. So we will lose lots of self-determined independent jobs. So unfortunately, what is happening, and we don't have to have a crash. I mean, at some point, you'll just uh, cancel out a few zeros. You can even do it selectively in the new digital pay, e-pay, internet world. You can say, well, that bank gets canceled out some of its debt. This guy is not so nice. I, uh, he'll still keep his, his debt and so on and so forth. So actually, this this dystopy could uh, could um, it, it makes sense the logic fits together and uh, unfortunately it could work well that's a very gloomy point of view and i think we probably will come back to it as in the next half hour but i now want if i may to turn to the second question namely situation in the us following the defeat of trump and the election of biden as it happens i've just spent several weeks in america i visited uh, new york washington palm beach um, uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, the prosperous North Alabama towns of Birmingham and uh, Huntsville. Huntsville is not very well known in the world, but in fact, it's the center of a lot of the communications, defense, military, and other industries in it the United the States. Space, space uh, program center, Werner von Braun. Uh, NASA is there, the Redstone Arsenal is there, that's right. Um, and of course, uh, that, that was where Werner von Braun uh, developed the initial set of rockets and if you uh, go to the uh, region uh, my wife had a house near, has a house nearby um you'll find the munich restaurant and the uh, 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 any number of uh, 
German restaurants, though they're being overtaken these days. Now, my brief and hesitant observations are, you know, people say America is a divided country, and it is, but it's very oddly divided. Um, it divides, as I see it, the American middle class on the one hand, from a coalition of about equal size, composed of racial, ethnic, and other minorities, corporations, the media, cultural institutions generally, accompanied by a section of the white middle class, um, what we might call them is uh, woke uh, liberals, um, who on racial questions, and that is now the dominant question in the United States, they express more radical views than do black and Hispanic voters. So th this is an, an odd division uh, in because the what we used to think of as the real America is now 50% of the country. And, and it has another 50% sort of big allied against it. Um, uh, I would say that although this is an unstable coalition, uh, the left side of it, uh, sorry, the left coalition does think that its victory is assured long term. Um, the partisan division is intense and covers almost all issues. It's extraordinary that the question of wearing masks and attitudes to lockdown, they are now highly ideologized. Um, and people express passionate um, views about them. Um, in general, um, except for the universities, where the kids, of course, are rebelling against lockdown. But nonetheless, generally speaking, you can say that it's urban America plus university town America versus small town and small city America. I think Biden's personality is key to the present situation. Um, he and his very moderate image explain the victory of the Democrats in the election. It's not the sole explanation. Uh, we discussed, you discussed it a moment, Max, uh, other reasons why this happened, but um, uh, he soothed voters and he continues to soothe voters despite the radicalism of his early policies on the border, for example, and uh, critical race theory and its application uh, to the federal government. Despite those, he continues to be a presence which stabilizes the situation. Um, the losers in this uh, political uh, battle still have a very strong political position defined um, narrowly. Uh, the Republicans gain seats in the House. They hold a lot of state governorships and assemblies, uh, which means that they will draw some up some of the electoral rules uh, for the next uh, election and they're expected to gain seats in both House and Senate in November 2022. But they have no sway in uh, most of the major cultural, economic, and other institutions in the country. Um, and they are afraid. This is quite extraordinary to me, having lived in America really on and off since 1988. Um, I went to a conference of conservative academics in, um, Fort Worth, Texas, uh, very moderate, reasonable conservatives, some slightly less moderate, but most pretty sober, middle of the road, respectable people. And they were actually afraid of losing their jobs, of not being able to write academic articles or get their books published, of being driven to the margins of American life, even if they win national elections. Now, again, there is one factor in the situation, apart from the elections of uh, midterm elections in 2022, which will uh, raises of real uncertainty. How long will Joe Biden be there? Because his presence strengthens the government in a curious way, even if he is apparently not always there in the sense of being able to understand what's going on. Um, but he, he will not decide if he will be there forever. I mean, obviously God will make, may make that decision, but others um, may make it too, because if they do very badly, the Democrats do very badly in the midterm elections, there'll be enormous pressure for um, him to go uh, and to replace him with, of course, Kamala Harris. I don't think she will want to become president until after the midterm elections, because she would then escape the blame. Um, if, she, if she were to be president, she would, she would be blamed for the losses. But if she comes in after uh, the midterm elections, because he has either died or retired, um, then I think 
there will be a ferocious political battle. And one has the terrible feeling that both sides feel no holes are barred in that battle because on the right, they feel we're really being um, driven, as I say, to the margins of political life and indeed out of political life and into a kind of hobbit-like existence in uh, the provinces. And uh, secondly, because the other side thinks that it's dealing with proto-fascists, although uh, I think they, they deliberately exaggerate that, that particular concept and, and consequent, and therefore what you have is a battle of images of oppression on both sides, uh, which is not healthy for a country. And although I don't think it's going to lead to civil war, I think it is going to lead to some very odd constitutional outcomes um, in the next four years. Now, that's my kind of slightly gloomy take on the situation. So I want to turn back to Boris, if I could, and ask him for his views on the fundamental changes, if they are fundamental, that he sees taking place in the United States. And how does he think that that is going to affect the politics of Europe? Well, first of all, I'm not an expert on American politics, so I will defer to the other illustrious gentlemen here, but um, two basic thoughts, obviously, uh, are the fraying of the political landscape we have seen all over the Western world, that what uh, ha have been two party political systems have completely collapsed in, in a number of countries. And my sense in the United States is that these two big parties have uh, more and more difficulty simply keeping their act together. The, the differences within in them have become so big that one, one question for the future may be, uh, how long is the U.S. going to be able to, to keep its two-party system? Uh, the, um, the other question is, um, is immigration, will immigration reach a tipping point which will make it essentially impossible for Republicans to ever, to ever have a majority again? I imagine that the Biden administration will double down on encouraging immigration, giving, giving citizenship and, uh, and voting rights. And if it is true, John, as you said, that the, um, the ethnic and, and racial element in American politics has become dominant, then that may well lead to a structural disadvantage for the Republicans. I think it would do, uh, Boris. There is a countervailing uh, uh, factor, uh, though it's slightly long term. And it, to some degree, it depends on immigration not being endlessly high. And that is that, that we used to think, uh, we used to use phrases like the American white majority. Well, the American majority still exists, um, but it's not white anymore. I mean, if there is an intermarriage uh, between, let us say, um, Hispanic and the white, and uh, white and Asian, and white and black, and um, the likelihood is in most of those marriages that the children born to them um, will identify with the majority. Now, it won't be a white majority, but it will be an American majority with a, with a sense of attachment to the symbols and institutions of the United States. So that is something that, you know, the, the, the concept of the emerging democratic majority is, has not yet come to terms with. But on the other hand, one has to say that it, um, it, it can be swamped by uh, continuing to, uh, to bring in or allow to come in um, more and more numbers of people who don't feel any of the sympathies to, for American institutions and the American identity that people who are, who, um, who are members of that, uh, that non-white white majority uh, feel. I mean, um, that's something to bear in mind, is it, or not? Yes, well, obviously, it's um, the cultural dimension is, is key here. Can the Republicans offer a narrative to, um, to immigrants, to people who come from another ethnic or racial background? Can they meet, make them feel welcome, make them feel that uh, they are part of the family? That, that will certainly be key to, for the future of the United States. As for the, um, the impact on European politics, well, I see a continuation rather than a change um, with regards to um, the, the change of presidency. Obviously, 
the return to multi multilateralism is a key change between Biden and the previous administration. But on the other hand, there are key objective interests that are simply the United States interests. We have, we're witnessing a change from the um, Atlantic cooperation uh, born from the consequences of World War II. We're seeing a European Union becoming more assertive, trying to deal with Russia and, and China to some degree. And, um, and an, an American strategy fully realizing that um, China is a systemic competitor on a global scale, and that Russia, although it does not have that heft, uh, economically speaking, of China, and maybe not that, that skill either, um, but that Russia's disruptive politics towards um, the Western world need dealing with. And here I see confrontation uh, coming between European interests and American interests. That surprised uh, the uh, Biden White House, I think, hasn't it? The Biden State Department, that they they were expecting, I think, a warmer relationship with the Europeans and the EU uh, on relations with China. In particular, um, they were expecting to be able to form a common front, and and that is uh, and that is not happening. And it's. Well, it's, be, it's puzzled uh, the, um, to some degree, um, but it's a permanent fact of life, isn't it? And, and, um, and yet at the same time, doesn't it increase the vulnerability of both Europe and America in relations with, um, a research, well, I was going to say a resurgent Russia, but a still powerful and dangerous Russia um, and, um, and a rising China? Well, obviously, even demographically speaking, and, and it's been said that demography, demography is destiny. Um, the United States is, is not uh, suffering from these kind of problems, but Europe certainly, its share of world population and its share of world trade is steadily decreasing. So when I referred earlier to a tradition in European strategic political thought that it, 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 it would be, um, uh, it would be good to have some kind of co Euro-Asian cooperation, um, make full use of the, of the possibilities of this huge land mass um, reaching from the channel all, all the way to the uh, Pacific, from the North Sea to the Pacific. That, of course, for, for Europe uh, only would make sense, I dare say, if, if Europe itself is strong enough to, to contain Russian and Chinese challenges to, to its influence and its interests. I think I want to come back to this later if we have enough time, but for the moment, let me move on if I may. And this time, uh, because Max, I think, may have to leave before um, uh, they, b both of you, um, I'd just like to ask you what you think of Joe Biden's work so far um, compared to the direction that Donald Trump had established. How do you judge him? Um, um, and let's face it, uh, uh, on some of the foreign policy issues, uh, if not, uh, if on nothing else, Biden has actually, while denouncing Trump, has carried on some of the same policies. Uh, amazing, so, isn't uh, it? Yeah. So how do you judge overall his policies so far? Well, Trump was an accident for the people that run American politics. Um, which is not only the voter, but also, of course, very powerful interest groups, as in all Western democracies, but uh, in, in the US especially. So Trump was an accident. Trump was certainly not a strategist, but he uh, basically had an ear to the people because he was a showman, a real uh, social media star, whatever. So he, he said what the people wanted to hear. He said America first, which yeah. meant... Uh, jobs and so on. The people wanted to hear that. And there's some truth to that. There was not a consistent strategy behind it, but it was a good message. And um, to me, American multilateralism before Clinton, Obama, whatever, meant that uh, 
Yes, it's multilateralism in, in the sense that we, the U.S., say what's to be done, but we hide it under the cloak of multilateralism. So um, that's, again, and, and I see that Biden is stepping up the war, the, the war things and the, the tensions between China. And, and I'm the, there's very divergent interests. There's, um, I'm, but, of course, the military, there's this power elite or the, the military elite and and so under Biden, tensions are rising, as I predicted, and, and it's, it's certainly somewhat engineered. I mean, the Eastern Ukraine, you can, there's both sides to it, but now the tensions are rising in China. Now the tensions are rising, whereas a consistent economic strategy is still missing. Um, Biden is also continuing the vaccination strategy. He's claiming as success what Trump started. So, I mean... Superpowers are, they, to quite some extent, trapped in their trajectory and in the, in the forces that determine their trajectory. So not so much has changed, except that tensions are rising, that what Trump kept low is now flaming up again. And uh, <clears throat> that's uh, troublesome. I mean, the, the potential of a war, which, of course, also Graham Allison of Harvard uh, between China and, and the US or other kinds of wars is, is rising again. And that's, that's not a good prospect. Maybe also to Europe, uh, that there is not a more warmer reception is probably that in some ways the US has overplayed its hand vis-a-vis -vis Europe. I mean, the Russia sanctions, which Western countries in total do, are highly asymmetrical. Germany and Austria are basically really hurting for their trade with Russia, whereas the U.S. is only sanctioning persons in Russia and continuing with, continuing with its own trade. I've seen examples of firms where German firms were kicked out and American firms stepped in. So, And this is a covert warfare that the U.S. is not only conducting against uh, Russia and China, it's conducting it against continental Europe because continental Europe as a as an economic power is as big as, as the United States almost. But uh, yeah. um, so it's a complex issue, but uh, by and large, I think the world has become less safe since, since Biden stepped in. Um, yes, and let me, um, uh, first of all, let me point out that uh, the kind of uh, actions that you're decrying on the part of the Americans favoring their own imposing sanctions that in effect favor their own companies that that accusation and uh, that truth really goes back uh, to 1983 as well because when reagan was imposing an embargo on um, uh, the pipeline he he was he was not imposing a grain embargo <laughs> and and, uh, and that was made the, those points were made now you are however very pessimistic in the sense of forecasting the dangers of a global global conflict and, and outright conflict. Um, let me just ask you a very obvious question in these circumstances. You have the, the Chinese saber rattling over Taiwan and you have the Russians moving large numbers of troops to the Ukrainian border, to the Donbass line. Um, is it impossible to think that there might not be a coordinated attack <laughs> from both sides, the Chinese attempting to take Taiwan the Russians attempting to um, invade Ukraine more completely? Well, I, I what think would the, the movements of military material were initiated by the West towards the uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, eastern border. So the West started this months ago massively. And, and so it's a reaction by Russia. So and um, we only get in Germany, at least we only get reports about Russian troop movement. So um, uh, I think there's a clear sequence of events here. And uh, um, so I don't think it's coordinated. And I just think it's a testing and feeling uh, with all the, um, and we know about the personal ties of the Bidens to Ukraine, which is pretty shady. So um, I hope, I don't say it's a pessimistic view. I, I think, and I'm quoting Ellison here, we have to think about the scenario to, to think about how to avoid it also. Um, and I don't think that it is in, um, in uh, um, Putin's interest to attack. Um, China also has never really attacked um, 
except for the Chinese uh, Vietnamese war. So um, I see actually the um, I see the declining superpower U.S. as as the aggressive one in, in those uh, things. And I say this is an American. I have American citizenship too. So, but uh, obviously, however you view it, the situation, the tension has be, have be increased since Biden came in. I predicted that it has happened. And it's not a very comfortable situation, regardless of how you see cause and effect. Hmm. Well, I, I, I tend to think, obviously, that's a prudent analysis of the situation. But it's a prudent analysis that still leaves extremely grave risks. And I wonder where, uh, what, what is going to be the relationship between, on the one hand, um, um, the, the Brussels and the European Union um, and the United States in the event that conflict does break out in a curious way. At the moment, they both they both talk the same game in relation to um, to um, uh, uh, Ukraine uh, and resistance to Russia. But at the same time, how solid is NATO? I mean, this is the question that that allegedly Donald Trump raised. But in fact, it's always there. And um, do we see NATO? being uh, um, under these pressures and do we see it sustaining itself or do we see it gradually ceasing to be a genuine military alliance and becoming a talking shop well i was in in the, in the us in june 2001 was a german delegation talking to incoming bush uh, administration and if this was a three-day conference and Bush had, was having problems uh, with staffing his administration. So the undersecretary level was still pretty understaffed. And in every conference, uh, the question was, what's the new threat? What will hold NATO together? So people kept speculating about terrorism in North Africa. You can, you can actually conjure threats if you talk about them often enough. And NATO is still, um, uh, I think, if you look at the way the treaty is structured, is still able to, let's say, declare a defense case, and then you have you have actually martial um, martial uh, conditions or whatever, and then you may have uh, actually action, and then then you are in war or in, in the pre stages of war, and then it's very easy to let's say engage Poland and Germany, and then those France will play to some extent its own role, I think, but. Uh, the dangers that the flight to, to, to the flight ahead into a conflict uh, that that gamble is actually um, one that I self as a US policymaker would make. Um, and it's not a very pleasant one, but it's uh, maybe worth taking the risk if I tick like some of the neocons. And it's not an, it's not a uh, comfortable thought. Not, not a comfortable thought for Europeans in particular. And for my country also not. Yes, no, no, I don't, no, it's not a comfortable thought for anyone. But, but on the other hand, one can possibly say that the clearer and more committed members of NATO are to each other and to um, maintaining a solid uh, front on almost all the serious political issues, the less danger they are to be provoked um, by the Russians or by any other power too. David, uh, could I turn to you? And go, I want to go back to American politics here. Um, uh, you have been very pessimistic in the past about the, the possibility, uh, possibilities and opportunities um, for conservatism in Europe. And um, I wonder if you think that this, they are much less appealing now in the light of what's happened in the Trump, uh, in the United States to Trump. Um, and, um, it, and and do we do we see a conservatism beginning to revive in Europe? If so, in which countries, and um, and which side also of the English Channel? Yeah, that's that's of course very important. This um, these questions, and and, and and indeed, I I think that uh, after the last years had been marked by by a series of uh, of successes by different 
conservative parties on both sides of of uh, of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, now we see uh, some form of, of of new decline of conservatism. I mean, some years ago there was some form of enthusiasm. We had the the victory of of, of Trump. We had Boris Johnson. We had Salvini on on his path apparently to power. Uh, there was also the waiver. There was Thierry Baudet, Orban, uh, Kaczynski, and so forth. So there, there seemed one moment where people believed it might be possible to achieve at least some form of stalemate between populists, you could say, or conservatives on the one hand, and more politically correct orientations on the others. And then systematically during these last years, not only in the US, but also in Europe, this, this, this tendency has strongly de declined. Trump has been defeated. Uh, even the, the post-Brexit UK conservatives are in, 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 in the middle of an enormous mess. You could say the Rassemblement National is trying to define it again. Salvini didn't break through to power. The, the Flemish NVR is also under big, big, big pressure. Forum for Democracy is being dismantled on the inside. The, the AfD is just disintegrating. Uh, Hungary and Poland are very isolated. The, the demonstrations in Poland have also shown recently the full power also of leftist liberal movements. So there is some form of, 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 of decline that is, that is happening for the moment. But it, at, at the same time, I think might be an important lesson because we have to analyze all that and to understand why, why this happens. And I, I believe that um, the, the successes of these last years were due rather to surprise successes because nobody really expected Donald Trump to win or to go the Brexit to the Brexit to go through or so so forth. Uh, and, but but now you could say the empire is counter-attacking and, and 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 suddenly we see a whole range of uh, uh, of uh, conceptual uh, problems of modern day conservatism. And one of these problems is certainly that conservatism has underestimated the the, the full strength and commitment of the leftist liberal political consensus who simply doesn't want to integrate the new element and rather prefers to play within its own zone of quarantine. I think that is that is very important. Another point is, of course, that populism or conservatism in, in the West is not ideologically well defined. We have secular and neoliberal movements. We have more religious conservative movements. We have such movements who are oriented towards the US, towards uh, Russia. So there is some problem also of defining what conservatism really, really wants. I think that is also an important um, step that has been forgotten during the last years because it seemed that um, this um, proto-e-form uh, vagueness of, of, of populism, conservatism could be an asset and guarantee political victory. Now we see that it is also a liability. But of course, I think one of the, of the biggest uh, problems uh, is that we have seen that conservatism even, or populism, even when it is in power, is just, or that, that it just is, is, is able to stabilize existing conditions, but not really to push forth a real systemic change. The Trump presidency has shown that very strongly, partly also other conservative movements where we have seen, okay, these years are not lost, uh, they, but they, they, they have frozen uh, uh, an evolution for a period of years, but they have not rolled it back. I think that is also something important that we have to realize that there would be some more, some, some greater offensive power uh, that would be needed. And this offensive power would have, of course, to, to realize a series of, of, of different aspects. One is that many conservative parties still do not understand that the game is rigged. They still think that there are institutions, there are elections, there's separation of power. And if we play within democratic frameworks, then there might be an, a real chance to get to power. But of course, the events of the last years have really shown that this, this, this separation of, of powers is in fact abolished by the fact that everywhere people are convinced by this politically correct uh, um, mainstream thought uh, and that in fact it is very difficult if not impossible to to break that many populists seem to me to be uh, some form of last democrats because they still believe in some form of democratic ideal that in reality has already disappeared 
Another important point, I think, that has also been illustrated by the defeat of Donald Trump and what is happening now also in Europe is, of course, the, the, the immense power of media. Many conservatives may have believed that once in power, the media would partly shift their attention and try to line with them, but the contrary has, has happened. And uh, many conservatives has, have simply forgotten the, uh, the important axiom of politics that Nancy Pelosi is still in November of 2020 quoted when she quoted uh, Abraham Lincoln, who said, public sentiment is everything. With it, with it, you can accomplish almost anything without it, practically nothing. And that is something that has been that has been largely forgotten. Conservatives have uh, have forgotten to build up their own parallel media system, their own parallel education system. They they hoped that somehow once in power here and there, uh, by pure sheer opportunism, these systems would shift side. That hasn't happened, and that shows, of course, the the importance of building up a new system because we can't hope to achieve a new march through the institutions as that was possible for, for the leftists in the second half of the 20th century. And the, and the last point I would like to, to underline, it has, this has also been, been shown by the present evolutions in the US, but also in, in France and other European countries, is that the um, governments themselves are turning more and more some form of of blind eye to real conflicts such as social polarization or or ethnic conflicts or, or or the financial crisis so they only engage in some form of patronage politics in order to keep to keep uh, to keep people uh, people down but power is shifting more and more towards the streets. We have seen that with the Yellow Wests in France. We have seen that also with the Black Lives Matters uh, in, in the UK, in, in the US. We are seeing it now partly in Poland with the strike Corbett. And I think that that is something that conservatives need to realize that they also have to, to play on that field and to muster also massive support on the street uh, to have at least a punctual possibility of, of acting on, uh, on the media, on public perception of politics and to show their power, to show also their possibility to be an ordering force to impose also some form of social and, 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 and uh, cultural values to form a, a parallel society as all these immigrant societies, essentially, of course, Muslims and populations here in, in Europe are doing it. They are forming uh, parallel societies that function within their own framework. And many conservatives, I think, should take an example of that and building up something parallel that would be a firmer basis then for, again, the conquest of public opinion and ultimately, of course, uh, political power. Um, let me say that at the conference I was mentioning of uh, the Philadelphia Society in uh, Fort Worth, Texas that I attended, um, that this point, the, your final point there was made repeatedly that, that we are now going, we have to enter a period in which we painfully construct a series of alternative institutions. To some degree, of course, the Conservatives did that in the 60s and 70s between uh, the defeat of Goldwater and the election of Ronald Reagan. But this, it seems to me, is had to be done in a much more a fundamental way. Uh, um, no one in the 1960s or 70s suggested abandoning the public schools. People now will say that you cannot actually get, expect to get an honest, good and virtuous education in the American public schools. They're now, they're now the agencies of indoctrination. So. I, I think that lesson has been well learned, but of course, it's a painful lesson that implies a long, long struggle, rather like the decision to grow an orchard. You, you probably will never live to see the fruition of your hopes. But on two other points I want to raise with you, um, I agree entirely that public opinion um, is, in a sense, all. And that's, as, as, as the quotation um, from Lincoln that Pelosi cited, makes clear that's been a, a something we've known since the 19th century i mean you can see in the debates on democracy that that opinion that public opinion was the key uh, element in yielding to the uh, democratic pressure that that's been a truth which conservatives have, have, have not learned sufficiently 
Um, it also explains your other point that um, the, 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 the disutility, the unutility of the separation of powers, uh, because that works well when the institutions are acting in response to institutional uh, values and objectives. But when the institutions become the expressions of the interests of a particular class, and that's what Robert Bork said the American courts increasingly were, then you have a much deeper problem. So the question then is, um, do we see in either Poland or Hungary or in Britain with uh, the Tories and Do Boris Johnson, do we see any sign that can, do we see that the conservatives are beginning in those places to learn um, are the, uh, uh, new ways of dealing with their political uh, problems and enemies? Or are, are, are these movements, in a sense, the last gasp expressions of, of a previous conservatism that had some force of its own in the society? Mm. It's a very difficult question, of course. I would say bo both answers are true. There are, there are both currents, I would say, within uh, modern Polish or, or Hungarian conservatism. There are, of course, people who, who really understand the, the, the what is at stake mm. for, 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 for the future, who try to, to, to model the institutions in order to become more resilient and to become less permeable to the uh, control of uh, leftist liberal uh, thought and, and, and elites and, and clientelism. There is, of course, also the other approach that still sees the world through the, the lens of the 1980s and doesn't really uh, realize um, everything that has happened uh, in between. I see that very often here in Poland, unfortunately, even when I speak to, 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 to people around me in my professional environment, even also in, in, in politics, many people do not yet realize how far things have gone in Western Europe, not only in the political sphere, but also when it comes to basic problems such as mass immigration, cultural identity, uh, um, civic disorder. And so they, they do not want to believe that. They do not want to see these issues. They have some form of idealized image of a Western society or Western European society that is somehow uh, in advance in comparison to the East and that it is necessary to, to keep up and to imitate uh, these different steps. And I think that that is of course deeply anchored in the experience of the of the Cold War, in what Kundera has called the kidnapped West. This impression that you need again to be formed part of the West. Only a few people who have been there to to have spent some time in London or in Paris and have mm -hmm. seen the influence, of course, happening there, are slowly realizing that that it is now that 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 uh, Poland or Hungary should not imitate the West, but to the contrary, that uh, finally, if you come to to think about this, Poland and Hungary are in some ways much more the the real Europe as it was and as it should be. Then, uh, then Western Europe, which has ceased to to be in this immediate continuity, also with our uh, with our traditions. So th that is very uh, a big problem, also I think within the the conservative movements, political movements here in in Poland, and I guess also in Hungary. Um, that is also accompanied by by another big mistake. That is that many people uh, in the uh, Eastern Central uh, European countries still think along national lines and they think well if i don't meddle in the affairs of of germany or france or the us if i leave them alone then they will leave us alone in doing what we want in our national environment and of course they do not understand that the the sake of uh, what is happening within nation states is now uh, also uh, very often uh, influenced by by by, by outer uh, perspective and that for example elections here in poland are, are not only won uh, within Poland itself, but depend to a large state on how the Germans are talking about these elections, what information they're sending back to Germany, how the European Union, how Brussels is influencing uh, public opinion on Poland. All that is, pay, is, is playing, of course, into mm. the, the internal events here. And I think that many politicians have not yet understood this tremendous influence of a world 
that, that has become globalized, if we want or not, uh, a Europe that has that is now very strongly intertwined, and that conservatives have to accept this, even if you don't like it, and, and have to, to play with it, to use these instruments and not to let just the enemy use it. And that is why I'm so strongly also in favor of the need of, of conservatives in Eastern Central Europe, where they are still in power, to use this momentum in order to, to, to create tighter links also with uh, conservative movements all over Europe, to, 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 pay, to, to play also the role of, or to, to exert some form of patronage on French conservatism or German conservatism, which, which could be done quite easily with the possibilities that uh, governmental uh, power gives to them. But this chance, uh, this possibility that is creating allies now while you are in power in order to be sure that if once you lose the power, you still have someone to fall back on or who could help you in case of necessity is not yet fully, fully understood. So that is why I'm hoping, of course, that the initiatives like now the discussions between Orban, between uh, Kaczynski, Salvini, other movements within the European Parliament might perhaps lead to some form of entente. And that is also one of the reasons uh, why I personally was so active when it came to, to drafting that book, Renovatio Europa, or of, of drafting the, the, um, this, this project of a preamble for future European uh, constitution in order to build up some form of of, of basic understanding between conservative movements where they could say, okay, this is our minimum program that unites us. We have our differences, but this is still some form of, of understanding that we could use in order to fight together uh, against this, this leftist liberal hegemony. But this process of, of understanding is slow. And I really hope that this understanding, that it's full understanding will set in before, before it is too late. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I want to ask one last question to Boris, and in a way is to pick up some of the ideas we've just heard and transpose them to geopolitical questions. Um, obviously, we, Britain hasn't uh, played much part in our discussion tonight. Brexit has, in a sense, ensured that the British are slightly outside the uh, main circle on a number of questions, and that's in a sense, what they were asking for, and um, I certainly don't complain about it. But um, I wonder whether, as we look at the various things we've been discussing, both in terms of ideas and ideology, and but also the terms of economics, economic cooperation, uh, trade, and of course, military and diplomatic alliances, do you see that any sign that perhaps what's happening is that there is a split in Western civilization? a split which maybe was forecasted by Sam Huntington, who said that the West was the one civilization which didn't have a metropolitan center, so to speak. I mean, America might be the leader of the West in a military sense and, and, and achieve in the post-war years immediately enormous dominance, but it, that dominance was fading. Um, I wonder if we can't see as a possibility that the Anglo-American world along with um, uh, other people who, in a sense, um, separate as a marginal to Europe, might not form, in a sense, begin to form a different civilization um, from continental Europe in the same way that the, the uh, Christendom was divided between Catholics and Protestants. The, the, the views became sufficiently different that countries where one was dominant and the other was subordinate and began to uh, uh, form collectives, um, and and the world uh, the world of Christ Christendom became seriously divided. Of course, it led to a thirty years war and a lot of other bad things. But ultimately, that divided Christendom actually conquered the world. Um, those days are past. But do we, do you see um, a, a division of Western civilization today um, in anything like that way? Well, that's a very profound question, John. And before I turn to it, I would like to um, to react to some aspects of what uh, David said. I, I, for my part, uh, not the most ideological of persons, and I, I do think 
that uh, the great force uh, of conservatives um, and the basis of, of perception of anything is really problem solving. So uh, why did we have a, a low point uh, on the left liberal side for a number of years now? Because they had ceased to be able to solve the problems in their societies. They had even lost the um, capability of expressing, of formulating these problems. The vocabulary was lacking to even, to even say what was going on. And uh, the great um, advantage of the conservatives in this time, uh, especially in Hungary and Poland, obviously, was, was to come on, come on and, and, and take up issues, pick up on issues which would matter to people and which were neglected by, by liberals. So one issue was the euro, which is the initial topic for IFK in Germany. Another is uh, immigration, obviously, um, cultural cohesion, all these uh, issues are important to people on the ground and they define uh, what people will support. Now, some of these things have been co-opted by liberals nowadays. Macron has, has essentially declared war on radical Islam. This is a conservative uh, uh, topic. Um, the immigration has now the, the Hungarian and, and Polish, Polish view on immigration that we need strong um, strong border protection that we need to send back people who are criminals, don't belong here, are not entitled to protection, are not actually refugees. That this this must be the strategy, and that has been co-opted on the European level to some extent, at least by liberals as well. And to that extent, um, the appeal of conservatives for European citizens has has slightly decreased. So uh, I, I would I would. Uh, suggest that the, what conservatives need to do is to analyze the problems in society, speak up, name them, name these problems uh, in a crisp and efficient manner, and, and then offer solutions that, that seem sensible. One big issue of the, obviously is family policies. Uh, how do we solve the demography? Here, Hungary has gone ahead and offered solutions, and we, need, we simply need time to, to see where that leads. Well, let me try to, um, um, maybe, David, you want to come back quickly on that, because, no? Um, in that case, let me just uh, say that, of course, um, the, the business of politics is to solve the problems of society that history throws up. And um, the reason for the Thatcherite, Reaganite uh, ascendancy, relatively brief though it was, um, nonetheless, it, was, it existed because practical politicians, Mrs. Thatcher was above all a practical politician, actually set about trying to solve the problems of inflation, excessive union, trade union power, uh, the Soviet aggression in the Cold War, and, and made a good fist of actually solving those problems. Um, and I think, Maurice, you're um, completely right to say that unless politicians, conservative politicians, among others, offer realistic solutions to problems, they won't get a hearing or they get a very brief one. The second thing, however, is that every now and then an improbable change occurs. And sometimes in politics, changing the strength of one party and, and improving the strength of another. And sometimes that's the result of events in the world, um, a, a crash, um, um, a war, um, a defeat in war, but sometimes it's the result of a political genius who sees in the existing structures of politics uh, opportunities that practically no one else had seen. I think, for example, of Benjamin Disraeli in the 19th century, who saw the issue of imperialism. The British had had an empire, but they didn't have imperialism. It didn't play much part at all in British political life until he suddenly realized that imperialism was an issue on which the working class could be brought to support the conservatives. And amazingly enough, surprisingly enough, I would say that's what he did and established a conservative dominance that really has lasted more or less uh, all the time since then. So I think we never know what's going to happen in politics is my final summing up. Same for me, it's been a privilege and a pleasure, John, to be here. Well, first of all, it only remains therefore for me to, th to thank um, all of you uh, for a very stimulating discussion. Um, I would say I'd like to thank the two of you who are present and two people who are absent. One, of course, um, is, is um, 
uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Ms. Dr. Otte, and the other is the unseen organizer of this discussion, Shoma Hegedus, whom I'm very grateful indeed for putting it together and for um, bringing us all to debate these questions. I hope we'll be able to do so again soon. So, um, uh, David, many thanks. Boris, many Thank thanks. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution.